Can everybody hear me? All right, good, good, good. Um, my name is Jay Parkinson. Um, are the slides up? Hold on. Ah, there we go. No. All right, we are up. Um, my name is Jay Parkinson. Um, that sort of screwed up, didn't it? <laughs> um, I grew up outside St. Louis in a farming community. Um, and it was kind of funny because I was really into clothes as a kid. And I was also into golf as a kid. And those were two things that farmers' kids don't like. You know, so I sort of um, had a rough childhood. Oh. <laughs> Are we good? All right. Sorry. Um, so anyway, I had sort of a rough childhood because they just didn't like me very much. So for some reason, I was able to, you know, um, overcome that over after a few beatings, and. I really didn't care after a long time, like why people just didn't like me. So somehow, I mean, fast forward about like 18 years, 22 years or something like that, and I, I, I go to medical school, and um, this is, these are my two best friends in medical school. We always hung out at the back of the, of the you know, the, the room, and um, we had a great time. You know, we studied enough. To, uh, to learn how to be excellent doctors. Um, but, you know, we knew that there was some balance in life that we had to have. And um, we finally graduated. You know, we're all successful people nowadays. It's really exciting and everything. But then, you know, I went down to, um, I went to St. Vincent's to do my residency in pediatrics. And uh, I continued to sort of get in trouble a little bit. Um, one of the things that got me in trouble was just, I just refused to wear a tie. You know, I hated those things as a doctor, uh, especially for kids. I thought they would, you know, be, I thought they were sort of terrified by these things. And I was too fashion conscious to wear those like goofy pediatric ties. So I just couldn't do it. So that graduation picture was actually the last time I wore a tie. And then I took it to the extreme and went to the, you know, New York State and actually got them banned in New York City, in New York State. And I was like, take that, Dr. Grubman. He was the one that tried to make me wear a tie all the time. And I finished that up, and I went down to, um, to Hopkins and did uh, a couple of rotations um, with these guys, actually. And little did I know that um, I was working for the only um, pharmaceutical wash dog group in America. Um, there's eight people at Public Citizen, um, Ralph Nader's group down there. And we submitted some petitions to the FDA, um, and we got a few black box warnings on some drugs that were pretty much unsafe after, when, after they went to market. Um, and then I started working with this guy at Hopkins in his department. And I learned, basically, you know, this is Peter Provenos, the guy that was just mentioned in the last talk, um, the surgical checklist guy. And basically what he said, what I learned from him was everything's a process and everything is an experience. And that was sort of the first introduction I had to design, as a matter of fact. Um, and around that same time, I started reading this gentleman, actually just a really great essay that he had, and he's, this, his name is Eugene Debs. He's the only guy in, in the history of America to run for president from a prison cell and get 5% of the vote. And he said, when great changes occur in history or when great principles are involved, as a rule, the majority are wrong. Well, we all know healthcare is broken. I mean, that's not too much of an, you know, it's a no-brainer there. But is the majority wrong? And I think that's a really important question to ask. I sort of think it is. And so I just decided to take it upon myself. I had about $1,500 after my residency at Hopkins, and I started a, um, a practice. It was essentially online. This was my blog. Um, but patients could go to my site. This is in September of 07. Patients could go to my site and say that I was a new kind of doctor. I sort of matched up that old time family doctor um, with the internet. And so basically what that meant was that people would go to my site, they would see my Google Calendar, and they would choose a time and tell me their symptoms and their address. My iPhone would alert me, I'd do a house call, and they'd pay me via PayPal, and we'd follow up by email, IM, or video chat. 
Again, $1,500, and my overhead was about 10% compared to a traditional doctor's office of about 70%. This is what it looked like. Um, and the fascinating thing was I did get 7 million hits in the first month. I never had a problem with getting patients. Um, people in my neighborhood of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, were very excited to have a doctor that communicated just like them. And then all of a sudden, the um, sort of healthcare press started paying attention. And then, you know, Fast Company and mainstream press started paying attention. And this led to something called Hello Health. And um, if you can imagine Hello Health being an electronic medical record designed by a 22-year-old, that's what it is. Um, so you could see, you know, doctors, profiles, as a patient you could sign up and a little wizard took you through everything so that you could, you know, input your medical history and all that exciting stuff. And then you could choose a time and choose which doctor you want and you'd meet them in their office. After that, you could email IM and video chat with them and that's what this looked like. So the other side of things, we had to design things for healthcare professionals, of course. So we had to design a system so that doctors could set up their availability. And keep in mind, this is all about augmenting the doctor-patient relationship. So you would actually go in and see the doctor first after you establish that in-person relationship. It opened up all these means of new communication with them. So the doctor had a you know, really beautiful dashboard of what's going on in their practice. And this is very similar to Facebook's news feed because you know, how many times can we rip off other people that are doing really well and apply it to healthcare? I mean, that's sort of been my philosophy all the time. So you could see, you know, um, Jessica Price, you could see what she was all about, all of her, all of her uh, medical history is, you know, sort of right there once that person went in to see them at Hello Health. Um, and then you could, of course, you know, document. It was all the tools you need to power a 21st century doctor's practice. Um, I could even prescribe links because I think that's a really important thing for doctors to do in the future and today is prescribe links so that their patients understand what's good and bad on the internet. And it's also a social, <clears throat> a social network for doctors. So I could friend a doctor who's using Hello Health in California and have a direct connection to them. So it was really a, a, an organic network of doctors and it wasn't really dependent upon bricks and mortar. It was more dependent upon this really interesting system that, were connect, that was connecting them in their office online. Um, and we had to prove this out, so we had to build a practice. And this is what the practice looked like in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Um, and you know, we wanted it to look more like a, a living room than a doctor's office. Uh, and then we had to do the ads and all that stuff. And then we put ads in the, in, the, um, in the subway. And I think this really highlights exactly what we were trying to do. All of this was designed to function as one really beautiful, amazing experience that people loved. And then one day, I got this really um, scary letter from the um, New York State Department of Health. And it said, the issue under investigation is an allegation concerning the parameters for conducting a medical practice via the internet, as well as regarding your photography website. And I was like, whoa, what does that mean? Well, I am a photographer, actually. I've worked with Rolling Stone, uh, Men's Journal, um, you know, I've shot some lookbooks for some um, uh, model agencies in New York, and I take pictures of people. I'm a, I'm a portrait photographer. Somebody didn't like this for some reason, and that's when I learned that anybody, anywhere in the world can call up the New York State Department of Health and say, I don't really like this doctor. You should investigate him. And that scared the hell out of me because I invested nine years of my life, $300,000 of my, my money to become a doctor. And it's fascinating because the NHS didn't have a problem with that. They hired me to do a, a whole portrait series of patients and doctors in London. And it's just fascinating to me because it scared the hell out of me. It cost $8,000 of my own money. Um, I missed two days of work, so there's lost revenue there. And I got this letter saying we apologize for any inconvenience. And I was just like, what the hell? You know, that's a horrible system for me to be in. So I learned some lessons. And I learned that the medical culture is not only uncreative, it's possibly anti-creative. And that's depressing to me, because innovation's lonely. Um, I don't really get much criticism except for my own colleagues criticizing me online. And 
everybody, patients, are extremely happy with doctors that want to be accessible and communicative. That's amazing, right? But it's just fascinating to me that it seems like my colleagues are the ones that, that, that don't like me. But a tech solution to a political problem is going to fail about 99% of the time. And that's sort of my lesson learned from Hello Health. Um, but most health solutions really aren't medical. They're cultural, right? So I just want to you know, talk about why are we doctors so uncreative, you know? Well, on the first day of medical school, you sort of fall in the line. You know your role. You see all these attendings. You see the residents. You're at the lowest portion of the system. So you fall in the line, and if you don't, you get this long line of doctors saying, what the hell are you doing? You know, you shouldn't be doing that. That's different. And then we take all these tests. We learn all about all these algorithms and protocols and pathways and all that stuff. And then we take multiple choice tests, and it's easy for the, the, the attendings to grade. So we basically just regurgitate. We don't really creatively think. The hardest test I ever took was in um, an immunology class in undergrad, where they gave me a paragraph problem. And the test was design a study trying to, trying to prove this, this hypothesis. And that was really hard. That's not if you have the vaguest clue as to how talented someone has to be to lead a surgical team. I have an MD from Harvard. I am board certified in cardiothoracic medicine and trauma surgery. I have been awarded citations from seven different medical boards in New England. And I am never, ever sick at sea. But if you're looking for God, he was in operating room number two on November 17th, and he doesn't like to be second-guessed. You ask me if I have a God complex? Let me tell you something. I am God. <laughs> One of my favorite movies, Malice. Um, that's true, though. I mean, doctors have an element of a God complex. We have to, right? We have to be right. I mean, that's our opinion, and sometimes our opinions, you know, cause life or death. Um, we are trained for perfection, and being trained for perfection as a designer is not really that, it's not really how design works. Um, so it's sort of counterintuitive. Um, the other issue is we're pretty much enslaved by debt. Um, Thursday, last Thursday was a glorious day of my life. I, um, for the past two and a half years, three years, I've been stuck in this $5,000 a month medical uh, school repayment program. I couldn't, I couldn't consolidate and refinance because there were issues with the uh, federal government. Nobody was refinancing due to the economy. I was stuck for $5,000 every month. Um, on Thursday, it was finally refinanced, and now I'm at $844 a month for 360 months. I'll be 65 when I pay this off. The point is, whenever you are under that much debt, you do everything you can to just be comfortable. And innovation and entrepreneurship is not comfortable. Um, and the other thing is, you know, when residents finish their residency, they're about 30, and they just want to settle down. I mean, they've been working their ass off for the past nine years in medical school and residency, and they just want to settle down and have kids. And kids just, just you know, they just, they're, they're, they're a lot of work. So you can't really innovate. You can't really be an entrepreneur whenever you're just trying to settle down and have a good time. And because you've been working so much, you just want this life of comfort and luxury. I mean, it's like your 20s have been kissed by. So you're just sort of looking to have a good time and be salaried by a hospital and just move on and have a good time and be comfortable and complacent. So we're not very agile people either. And you know, as we all probably know, a lot of doctors are giving up their primary care practices and becoming um, has salaried physicians, which is a good thing. The more salaried physicians in the world, the better. But what that means is they become part of parts of institutions that sort of look and function as fast as this. When you really need, you know, people like like this working in their their home. This was my apartment whenever I started my practice. I look haggard, um, and it wasn't nice. I was poor, you know. But this is the agility that I needed to start my own practice. 
Um, being different is expensive, too. Uh, I'm starting a new company in New York City called Sherpa uh, in about November. And uh, we're looking to purchase malpractice insurance uh, for, for our doctors. And we found that we have a choice of two malpractice covered um, insurance companies. One claimed insolvency about a, a year ago. So it's kind of interesting that like, there's really no competition, and they're basically just charging us as much as they possibly can. And it's just expensive to start something um, that they don't really know about. We're also scared. And this is one of my favorite things on the internet. This is Dr. Cranky's mumbled gripes. It's a um, question and answer site powered by Tumblr, and I think it's one of the coolest things on the internet right now. He's answered about 1,600 questions, and they're very long and detailed. I would love to go to a doctor that I could see 1,600 questions answered by him or her over the past year and a half, because that's how I can tell their, their, their personality. I can, that's how I can tell their critical thinking. Um, but as you can notice, Dr. Cranky isn't a real person. You know, that's his pseudonym. And so he actually is providing amazing medical advice under a name. I don't even actually have talked to him. He won't tell me his name. And it's terrifying because that's, I think this is a great service that doctors should be doing. And he's, he's scared of being sued. And the other issue is we just can't get along. I mean, the four major players of, health, of the healthcare system, hospitals, doctors, patients, insurers, we're all going one direction. And we're all going the different direction. And so I wish as doctors we could just get along, but you know, you gotta have you gotta match up innovative hospital networks, innovative doctors, innovative patients, innovative insurers. And you know, it gets pretty hairy. So we can't really look for inside help either, which is sort of scary. Um, I have a company called The Future Well, it's a design firm. And we created something called Sherapy uh, with Sanofi of, in, in Paris. And uh, it's pretty cool. There's a lot of really bad stuff on the internet, and there's a lot of really good stuff on the internet. So it gives doctors a, and nurses a way to say, you know, I'll favorite this diabetes article because it's actually a great article, and I want all of my diabetics to read it. So whenever you see a patient, um, you've you know added 30 articles to your diabetic profile, and you just ask for their email address and send it to them, and they get to see what you think is the best of the internet. And it was really nice. We sort of developed it, we developed it and designed it and got a sort of dream team of people working together on it. And we took it back to Sanofi and they were like, oh, this is great, we love it. You know, let's launch it next week. And then, you know, they're like, hold on, but we have to let legal see it first. You know? And of course it's dead, right? Because legal said, well, um, this is actually like web 2.0 real-time information, and it's gonna have Sanofi's name on it. I don't know if we can do that. So they're all scared of what's going on on the internet. And it's really difficult to go internal to the, the healthcare system and try to get their expertise. But when everybody's so scared because it's such a weird sort of time in our history of the internet um, and what it means to healthcare, it's, it's causing issues. So um, i just sort of whip through this. Uh, but the point is, you know, what can we do about this? Um, well, first of all, we sort of have to admit there's a problem. It's not that we're really uncreative. I mean, we're anti-creative as physicians. But I think the really cool thing that we can do is just, you know, teach design and creativity in medical school. I don't know if we're actually doing that really well. Can we partner medical schools with design schools and engineering schools and business schools and art schools specifically? Um, and then we just need to create this ecosystem of support. Uh, right now, the, su the support is, is sort of non-existent, you know? Somebody once said to me that the internet is the greatest generational divide since rock and roll. And I think that's totally true. Because right now, there are a bunch of students, um, I speak to uh, medical students quite regularly, and I always ask them, who's the youngest person in here? Somebody raises their hand and says, I was born in 1990. And that sort of blows your mind, right? But those people know something that they can teach these older attendings. And so we almost need to have a reverse education uh, for the older attendings uh, so that they learn all about computers and doing things new in a different way. Um, I think we should also have a sense of humor. I mean, being a good, do good doctor is more about being a good human than being a good god. And so 
Um, and to re just re reward innovation and make it financially lucrative and professionally satisfying. I mean, this is tough, but you know, things like Rock Health and others are, you know, they're coming together so that we can support this innovation, and it's a beautiful thing to see. Um, we also need to gather the innovators. Um, we often produce things on the internet, that's great, um, but the issue is, um, you know, people say, well, will doctors use this? And it's like, well, most doctors won't actually use it, but there's this really awesome fraction of doctors that will. And so we, I just launched this thing a couple months ago called Doctors of the Future. And it's like, you know, if you're a creative doctor and you, you know, want to be a part of a movement that sort of finds other really creative doctors, we'll just join up. So uh, we've had about 1,500 doctors across America join up. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I think we should talk about fears, too. I mean, is Dr. Cranky really at risk? I mean, probably not. I would say almost absolutely not. He's answering questions that's, you know, extremely valid and in an entertaining way. He's doing a great job. I mean, we need to talk about these un irrational fears for doctors using the internet, doctors sort of being creative. And the other thing is just accept more leaders. You know, we need more arts students. We need more theater students. We need more designers being accepted in a medical school. Because, you know, leaders to me are people who go their own way without caring who's following. And that's a big deal because, you know, people with courage, endurance, patience, humor, flexibility, resourcefulness, and determination, I mean, these are things that you don't really think of in doctors. Um, so I think that we need to uh, sort of rethink um, the base and accept more creative people into um, medical school. And I'm just going to finish with a bit of a cliche. But Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. What struck me there was medicine is so much an art. And there were 17 artists that they highlighted. And there's not a single doctor there. And so over the course of the next 10 years, I'm just asking that we all work together and put some doctors in an ad like that. It's beautiful. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Jake, can yeah. I ask you a couple of things? Sure. Um, talk about medical education for a moment, because in many ways, the characters and traits that you so criticize are, in some sense, naturally a product of the hazing that is what medical education is about. Would you separate out the, the uh, kind of training that's required for, say, a surgical specialty and put that in a different category than maybe the general medical practitioner that is the character it seems to me that you're trying in a very frustrated way to, to inhabit in, in, uh, in our age of anti-creativity? Where, where does medical education fit into creating a more diverse core of doctors? Yeah, I mean, you know, whenever you look at the, the, the role of a, a general practitioner, um, it's so much a relationship and so much about communication. And, um, you know, when you look at a, a general surgeon, yeah, there is an element of communication, but they don't need that much. You know, they don't need, the, we don't, they don't need to communicate as much as, as I do as a house call physician in Williamsburg who intimately knows my patients. Um, I would love to see that, absolutely. It's, 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 it's challenging because, I mean, I don't even know where to start. You know, I mean, how do you, how do you totally, I mean, we're trying to reform our elementary schools. How do we reform our medica you know, medical education schools? I mean, could you imagine a core of this Doctors of the Future idea of medical practitioners who are just as skilled as, as doctors, maybe not as skilled as surgeons, but wouldn't have to go to school in such an expensive uh, regime Mm -hmm. that would leave these people in debt, as, as you still are to this day. Right. I mean, 
I could have taken a job in New York City as a pediatrician, and I would have started out at $110,000, which sounds like a good chunk of change, but you know, whenever I'm expected to pay $5,000 a month, um, I just simply can't live on that. Um, so, I mean, what's scary is we're always talking about the medical home and, and, and the need for primary care docs, but I think I read it was about 3 to 5% of people who actually went into primary care last year who graduated residency. I mean, that's terrifying because when boomers retire, where are the primary care docs going to be? Well, you're going to have, you're going to be pretty busy. Well, although we're not a lot of boomers in Williamsburg. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Uh, although it's uh, inside the New York uh, <laughs> joke, we're both Brooklynites here. Finally, um, the the investigation that was started at the New York Department of Health, mm -hmm. you you said almost anyone can can start something like that. It, it's scary and terrifying, and you use that as sort of a way of saying that your colleagues possibly other doctors hate this idea of creativity. Now, I don't know anything about the investigation. You, you're sure that that wasn't like an old girlfriend or something? I don't started. think it was. Yeah. <laughs> no, I try not to <laughs> have too many enemies. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, what's it like? Uh, can you tell me about one of your patients in Williamsburg? What's it like to go up to their door and, and, and do an exam in, in the, you know, their comfortable surroundings? How's that different from the kind of medicine we've been talking about all, all, all uh, last few days? I saw an amazing portrait project the other day of um, people's uh, refrigerators. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't a picture of a person. It was just they opened their door up and just took a picture of it. And it was amazing because you know, they had pictures of a bartender, and they had a picture of someone who just got into Whole Foods like last week. And the difference in their refrigerator was so different. and like you could see exactly what type of person this person was. Because you got to see their surroundings. You got to see, you know, health is all about your immediate environment. I mean, it's about your, the homes that you live in, the neighborhood you live in, your friends. Um, whenever you get to know people in that context, I mean, that's being a real doctor. So aside from this sort of hokey romantic notion of a house call, it's actually an extraordinarily rich channel of data about individual Absolutely. patients that is efficiently absorbed when you simply knock on the door. Yeah, and I mean, I, my practice was set up so that I could see about six or seven patients a day. I kept it in like two zip codes, so I only went from you know Williamsburg and Greenpoint. And, um, but it was so much more effective, and I could do six or seven visits, but at the same time, in the, in the meantime, I could you know see six or seven people over email. So I was actually delivering a good chunk of care. Um, it was just, you know, um, but it, it, was, it was, to me, the most beautiful practice I could have. Is it hard to carry that MRI in your backpack? <laughs> Impossible. But you know what's amazing? There's a company called FastRad, and they're a mobile, you know, um, diagnostic radiology. Uh, really? group. So, I mean, they do mobile ultrasounds, mobile x-rays. So it's and coming. It, yeah, I mean, it's coming. The issue is all this stuff is just so poorly organized and not, um, it, the resources are just so underutilized and poorly organized. So I talked about Sherpa, uh, and that's exactly what Sherpa is, organizing these, you know, disconnected resources and giving a person, you know, a point person that they can call and sort of, it's like having a doctor friend. So, Jeff Parkinson, thanks so much. Thank you.